Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the first lecture on radiology of the musculoskeletal system, we'll, where we will be covering an introduction on positioning and as um, an introduction on fracture diagnosis. I'm Dr. LaRue, and I'll be giving these lectures. Firstly, we'll be covering the standard views of the long bones. And you'll see from these slides that positioning with devices like sandbags, foam sponges, or ties should be used whenever possible. In this day and age, it's not acceptable to expose yourself or your personnel unnecessarily to radiation, where alternatives exist to handholding. So starting with the thoracic limb proximally, we need to always acquire two orthogonal views of the structure of interest. So for the scapula or the shoulder, this is the mediolateral view and the cordocranial view. So for the mediolateral view, the patient is placed in lateral recumbency with the affected limb ventrally or on, on the cassette and the unaffected limb pulled cordially. The neck also needs to be dorsiflexed and this will remove superimposition of the sternum as well as the cervical vertebra from the shoulder joint. Unfortunately, the scapula will always show some degree of superimposition of these structures. The beam needs to be centered on the shoulder joint, which is located by palpating the major um, tubercle, so over here. Or if the scapula needs to be radiographed, one can center a little bit more proximally between the shoulder joint and the dorsal scapular margin. For the cordocranial view, the patient is in dorsal recumbency and the affected limb is pulled cranially as to get the humerus as close as possible to parallel to the cassette. The patient body should be rotated 10 to 15 degrees to the opposite side to separate the scapula from the rib cage and to prevent superimposition of the thorax and the shoulder or the scapula. One needs to again center on the shoulder joint or midway between the shoulder joint and the dorsal margin of the scapula. For the humerus, the mediolateral view is um, very similar. The patient is again placed in lateral recumbency with the affected humerus closest to the cassette. The opposite or unaffected limb is pulled quarterly and the neck is dorsiflexed. One needs to collimate to include the joints proximally, so the shoulder joint and distally, so the elbow joint, to the long bone. And this is a very important concept for all long bones, that is to include the joints proximal and distal um, to the bone. For the craniocaudal, the patient is placed in dorsal recumbency. The affected limb is pulled quarterly to try to get the humerus as parallel as possible to the cassette and the thorax again a little bit rotated away from the limb so that there's no superimposition of the thoracic wall with the humerus. The centering point is the mid shaft of the humerus. And the reason why we do a craniocaudal versus a cordocranial view with certain structures just has to do with the ease of patient positioning and how close we can get the structure of interest to the cassette and also has to do with um, radiation safety. Some positions require someone to hold the patient, whereas others can be positioned with sandbags and positioning devices. The radius and ulna, the affected limb is positioned on the cassette. Again, the unaffected limb pulled out of the way and the center centering point or the point where you want to center the primary beam is on the mid shaft of the radius and the ulna. For the craniocaudal view, the patient is in sternal recumbency, the affected limb is pulled cranially and the head and neck are positioned away to the side so that there's no superimposition with the limb. Again, center on the mid shaft of the radius of the, and the ulna and include the proximal joint or the elbow and the distal joint, the carpus. For the femur, the mediolateral view, all that needs to be done um, a little bit differently is that we adduct the unaffected limb away so that there's no superimposition with the affected limb which gets placed on the cassette. It helps sometimes to place a wedge in larger dogs um, beneath the tarsus and what this does is it just helps to bring the femur more parallel with the cassette. A problem may be encountered in very large dogs, for example this one, that where there's a marked difference in the thickness of the proximal limb versus the distal um, area of the stifle because of differences in muscle mass and soft tissue. 
And then what happens is that a single exposure will result in overexposure of the distal part because there's less soft tissue and underexposure possibly of the proximal part because there's much more soft tissue. So to overcome this, we can use a wedge filter or perform separate studies using different exposure factors of the two areas. Recently, um, this has not become necessary or needed anymore because the new CR or DR machines have the ability to post-process the images um, and one can see both structures in one radiograph. For the craniocaudal view, the patient is placed in dorsal recumbency and the limb of interest is extended caudally with the femur pronated slightly so that the patella is situated in the center over the distal femur. One needs the columnate to include the coxofemoral joint and the stifle joint. The image on the right just demonstrates how with the aid of positioning bands and ropes, um, the patient can be positioned without anybody needing to hold the dog. For the tibia and the fibula, it's very similar to the femur view. The affected limb is placed on the cassette. The unaffected limb is adducted and pulled away. And a thin foam pad can be placed underneath the hock, and that will just get the tibia and fibula more parallel and in line with the cassette. Again, include the joints proximal and distal to the long bone. For the cordocranial view, the patient is placed in sternal recumbency and the affected limb is extended caudally and rotated slightly, again, to try attempt to bring the patella in the middle of the femur. The unaffected limb is adducted and placed away from the body and um, one needs to center on the mid shaft of the tibia. A craniocaudal view in this um, respect can also be attempted but may be much more difficult to obtain because the patient has to be in a sitting position um, and this may require hand holding. So there are many indications for imaging of the musculoskeletal system, including trauma, for example, hit by car, gunshot wounds, limping or lameness, soft tissue swelling, draining tracts, and certification, for example, hips and elbow dysplasia. So the first section we'll be looking at is the radiology of fractures of the long bones. There are a few reasons why we would want to perform radiographs of fractures. The first one would be to plan surgery to evaluate the degree of bone and soft tissue trauma. Post-op views are obtained to evaluate the degree um, and adequacy of alignment and reduction. And then at certain time intervals, radiographs will be taken to monitor healing as well as to assess for possible complications with fracture repair. There are several important principles for fracture radiology. The standard two orthogonal views will always apply. We've mentioned repeatedly that the joints above and below the fracture need to be included. And this is mainly to assess rotation of the joints and of the fracture. The physis need to be examined carefully in young animals because missing a physial fracture can have serious consequences in a young puppy that still needs to grow a lot. And if there are structures that one is uncertain of, if it is a fracture or not, or if it's a normal variant, for example, a separate center of ossification or a nutrient foramen, then one can radiograph the opposite limb to compare with. This image is just an example of how failing to obtain an orthogonal view may result in misdiagnosis with disastrous outcome. For example, here there's a fracture of um, proximal P1 in a horse, which is a sagittal fracture extending into the fetlock joint and then exiting laterally. Whereas on the me lateromedial view, there's a little bit of a sclerotic line in this region, but the fracture itself isn't visualized. In this example, the fracture is just seen as two sclerotic zones on the craniocaudal view of the tibia, but the mediolateral view here will give much more information on the fracture orientation and direction of displacement. So to be able to assess fractures, one needs to know the normal anatomy. Physis may appear um, as if they are fractures to an untrained eye. For example, 
note the radiolucent physis of the distal radius and the distal ulna, as well as the distal metacarpal bones in this image here. The physis here at the proximal metacarpal bones are closed at birth, and this is just an example of how the physis may be open or closed. And they have ranges of fusion times according to each species, and this can just be looked up on a table and won't be expected for you to know. Nutrient foramina will occur in predictable locations and orientations in long bones. For example, in this bone, there's a radiolucent line extending from distally to proximally. Um, and if one is unsure about whether this is a fracture or not, you can radiograph the opposite limb and it will be bilaterally symmetrical. Mach lines are optical illusions that originate in the eye within the retina at the very stage of visual detection. And it produces variations between the physical luminescence of a surface and the brightness that you actually perceive in our visual system. So the dark lines we see at the edges of um, overlapping bones may mimic fractures. So if you know the anatomy and you know which bones are overlapping each other, this will help to figure out whether a line is a mach line or not. The image on the left shows dark lines on either side of the fibula, which is superimposed um, over the tibia. And on the right hand image, there's a mach line, this, this vertical radiolucent line, which is located between the diaphysis of the ulna and the proximal metaphysis and diaphysis of the radius. And this slide I've just included to show how the eye can easily be tricked. All the image is of is black squares and white crossing lines. But if you look where the white lines cross over each other, it appears as if there's a poorly defined little um, faint gray circle, which doesn't in fact exist, but it's our eyes just tricking ourselves. So just to summarize, pseudofractures can be anything from a Mach line to an open physis, for example, on the images to the right here, nutrient foramina, skull sutures, fascial planes, superimposed over bones or grid cracks. So when we need to describe a fracture, we have to do it in detail as if we're telling someone about it over the telephone and someone who doesn't have the image in front of them. So we need to tell them or describe the soft tissue changes. For example, is there gas? Are there foreign bodies present? Is there soft tissue swelling present? the anatomical location of the fracture, the extent of bone damage, the direction of the fracture line, the displacement of the fracture, and fracture, or how old the fracture is. Is it acute or is it chronic? Soft tissue changes are described as either closed or open. A closed fracture occurs if there's no skin penetration. Usually when we describe the fractures, we don't say that they're closed um, because we imply that they're closed. An open fracture means that the overlying skin is no longer intact, and this may be due to either a fragment protruding through the skin or an external wound. The risk of bone infection is greater with an open fracture, so it will change the prognosis and change the treatment plan. Radiographic evidence of an open wound will include gas opacities in the soft tissue. For example, this patient here, there's multiple coalescing radiolucent areas, which is consistent with gas which is located within the severe soft tissue swelling over the femur. Complete loss of bone um, or, or complete loss of soft tissue over the bone or marked loss of bone can also indicate that it's an op open fracture and the presence of a foreign body, for example, a gunshot wound is also likely to be open. Here's an example of an open fracture that just demonstrates marked loss of soft tissue with bone protruding or being exposed in this patient. The anatomical location needs to be described as accurately as possible or and completely as possible. We need to say which bone is affected and then further break that down into the epiphysis, metaphysis or diaphysis and then say is it a proximal, middle or distal fracture, does it extend into the joints or not and does it affect the physis or not. So to further classify or just um, go into a bit more detail about the anatomical location, the bone structure has an articular surface, the epiphysis proximally, the physis in an immature animal, 
the metaphysis, and then the diaphysis. And the diaphysis is split up into mid, proximal, or distal regions. And this image also just demonstrates the immature animal in the proximal half and the mature animal in the distal half, with the immature animal having an additional metaphysial blood supply, which the mature animal doesn't have. And we'll get back to this a little bit later in some of the other lectures, but the difference in blood supply does have some implications for fracture healing, infection, neoplasia, or metastatic spread. The extent of cortical um, damage is described as either a complete or an incomplete fracture. A complete fracture extends through both cortices, for example, on the left, whereas an incomplete fracture will have fracture lines that only involve a single cortex or a small portion of the bone. For example, here, the fracture is, extends from the medial cortex but does not reach the opposite cortex. Incomplete fractures can either be classified as fissure or stress fractures. Um, and these are a result of microfractures caused by repeated trauma over time that exceeds the loading capacity of bone. For example, race horses or racing greyhounds. And that's demonstrated on the left-hand side. A green stick fracture normally occurs in young animals. And it's an incomplete fracture on the one side of the bone with bending of the opposite cortex. Fracture displacement will always be described, um, the, we, well, we will be describing the distal fragment in relation to the proximal fragment. So in this case, there's a humeral fracture, but the distal fragment is displaced mildly caudally and proximally relative to the proximal fragment. In this case, we would need an orthogonal view to decide if there's medial or lateral displacement also present. This image just depicts the different types of fracture configurations or lines that can occur. The transverse fracture crosses transversely across the bone and is at 90 degrees to the um, cortex. An oblique fracture is exactly that. It extends obliquely across the bone. The spiral fracture has an S shape or a spiral configuration, whereas common unit fractures um, are multiple fracture lines that share the same origin. A reducible fracture just means from a surgical point of view that the fragments can all be relatively placed back into their anatomical orientation versus a non-reducible fracture, which tends to have too many fragments that can't be accurately replaced. As I've mentioned, a comminuted fracture has several fragments um, and fracture lines that communicate. For example, in these images, these will all communicate or extend from one point. And in the larger, if there are larger fragments um, present, these are called butterfly fragments. For example, the image on the left here. A segmental fracture consists of um, three or more fragments which do not communicate. For example, here is a um, fracture line and down here is another fracture line and they don't communicate with each other and here are three separate fragments to this bone. A compression fracture typically occurs in immature animals and the vertebra and results in shortening of the bone. For example here T11 is much shorter and wedge-shaped compared to the adjacent bones. A depression fracture typically occurs in the skull. Here's a post-mortem radiograph that shows a fragment here of the frontal bone, which is depressed into the, the um, rest of the skull with a radiolucent fracture line extending from here. Evulsion fractures occur at attachment sites of tendons, ligaments, or joint capsules, and are caused by excessive forces placed on these structures that result in a piece of a bone of the bone being pulled off of the parent bone. They occur in typical locations, for example, the tibial tuberosity, which is where the patella ligament inserts, um, and it's an insertion of the quadriceps muscles. The supraglenoid tubercle is where the biceps tendon originates, and the greater trochanter is where the gluteus medius inserts. Other locations also will include the calcaneus and the olecranon. <clears throat> 
slab fractures on the left are typically seen in cuboidal bones of the joints and are fractures that run from one joint surface to the opposite joint surface. For example, in this image, there's a fracture of the third carpal bone that extends from the middle carpal joint to the carpal metacarpal joint. A chip fracture is different in that it only affects a small fragment of bone, so only one articulation surface or one joint surface. And the presence of a fracture bed where it originates from helps to differentiate this from an accessory ossification sensor. These fractures are much more common in horses, so slab and chip fractures, and they might be difficult to diagnose in small animals due to their small size um, of the carpal and the tarsal bones. So here I've just put in um, orthogonal views of a skeletally immature animal, and you can take a few minutes just to see if you can describe this fracture according to what we've just discussed. So the answer is that we've got a closed fracture. We don't need to necessarily say that it's closed because we presume it's closed. But you can see that there is no gas, there's no loss of soft tissue, and there's no marked bone destruction. It's a complete fracture but it, because it extends from one cortex through to the other. It's a spiral fracture. It involves the mid to proximal diaphysis of the left tibia. And there is proximal caudal displacement of the distal fragment relative to the proximal fragment. Non-traumatic fractures can also occur, and these are either pathological fractures, which occur without abnormal or, or overt trauma as a result of secondary weakening of the bone by an underlying disease. They can be commonly seen with neoplastic weakening of the bone, for example, osteosarcoma, but it can be a result of systemic nutritional or metabolic disease as well, like nutritional secondary hyperparathyroidism. Stress fractures occur as a result of repeated loading of the bone by excessive stresses, and for example, will occur in racing animals. So the next slide is a very important concept to understand. Um, how classification of fractures of the, the growth plates occur in um, skeletally immature animals. So these fractures are classified according to the salter harris system. So obviously they don't apply to adult animals. Physes are radiolucent on radiographs due to their cartilage composition, and we'll have a look at that on the following slides. And on these images, the blue demonstrates the physial cartilage. So a Salter-Harris type 1 fracture means the fracture runs through the physis. A type 2, the fracture runs through the physis and then exits into the metaphysis, whereas a type 3 involves the physis and exits into the epiphysis. A type 4 extends through the epiphysis and exits through the metaphysis, where a type 5 is a compression fracture, where um, the bone is impacted into the epiphysis. The severity of the fracture increases with the increasing number of the Salter-Harris classification and the prognosis is poorer with the higher numbers. So a type 1 has a much better prognosis than a type 4 or a type 5. So next we'll just be looking at a few examples. Here is a skeletally immature animal. You can see the radiolucent physis are present. And here is a Salter-Harris 1 fracture through the distal physis of the femur. It's a bit difficult to define because the femur does have an undulating physis distally, but an orthogonal view will also help visualize this. In the next example, one can see how the physis of the femur um, is undulating. And it just depends in which plane we are visualizing it. But it looks with the normal limits on this craniocaudal view. On the mediolateral view, one can see actually where the pathology is. Here it's located um, where there's a Salter Harris 1 fracture of the proximal tibial physis. You can see how the physis is widened and jagged, jagged, but there's also an avulsion fracture of the proximal tibia. And this is where the insertion of the patella ligament is, and it's resulted in it being pulled up. <clears throat> 
can see that one can just visualize the difference between the two views and the need for an orthogonal view. Here's an example of a Salter Harris II fracture extending, involving the lateral aspects of the distal femoral um, physis, and then extending proximally through the metaphysis in this region. Here's an example of a Salter Harris III fracture where the medial aspect of the proximal tibial physis is affected with the fracture then extending um, vertically through the epiphysis. And the last example is a Salter Harris IV fracture, which is quite common in the elbow. It extends in this region um, through the intercondylar area and then out through the medial humeral cortex over here. Note that this fracture, as well as a Salter Harris III type fracture, are inter, inter art, or intraarticular fractures, and that will also um, affect the prognosis. So, if there is a complete and premature closure of the physis due to the Salter Harris fracture, we can see a shortening of the bone in the patient. If there's asymmetrical closure of the physis, so one side is closed relative to the other, um, or closure of one of a paired uh, a pair of bones, for example, the paired radius and ulna, this can lead to an angular limb deformity. The factors influencing the prognosis um, for uh, a prematurely closed physis will include the age of the animal. So the younger the animal, the more it still needs to grow. So it's poorer prognosis in younger animals and the proportional growth um, of that pretend, of that physis. This means that not, not all physis contribute the same amount to the length of bone. And we'll see that in the next image. The proximal radial physis only contributes 30% to its longitudinal growth, whereas the distal physis contributes 70%. So trauma to the distal physis will have much more severe consequences than trauma to the proximal physis. The proximal ulna only contributes 15% to longitudinal growth, whereas the distal physis contributes 85% of longitudinal growth. So typically the distal ulnar growth plate um, is affected um, and results in the most severe changes in um, small animals. It is susceptible to damage because of its conical shape. You can see this um, conical shape of the radiolucent physis here. Um, and only the dog has this conical shape. The cat's um, ulnar physis is different. So injury here will result in a Salter Harris V type fracture, so a compaction fracture, or it, um, and one does not necessarily see that on the initial radiographs. And only on the follow-up radiographs can one see that the ulnar physis here is no longer present, but the radial physis is still closed. And from here, we will have continual radial growth, but the ulna will stop growing, and then there will be um, typical radiographic findings. So if the, ulna will, or if the ulna stops growing, several changes will be seen. For example, the radius here will keep growing, and because of this, it will start bowing um, craniomedially. As it grows, it will push, push proximally on the humerus, which will open up this distal humero-ulnar joint space and result in distal humero-ulnar subluxation. The abnormal stresses will result in increased cortical thickness of the opposing um, radial and co um, ulnar uh, cortices. And the styloid process now will no longer be superimposed over the accessory carpal bone where it should be. When the distal radial physis closes, the appearance is quite different. The ulna in this case will keep growing, where the, whereas the radius will be very straight and upright, and there will be increased joint space proximally between the radius and the humerus, and increased joint space distally between um, the, in the radiocarpal joint. As the ulna keeps growing as well, there will be subluxation proximally and widening of the proximal trochlear notch or the proximal humeral ulnar joint space. And here we've just got another example showing this marked increase in humeral radial joint space because the, the radius has stopped growing. 
Right, so that is all for the introduction um, on fractures. And in the next section, we'll be carrying on with um, fracture repair and complications of fracture repair.